Hi, my name is Pete Scazzaro. I want to welcome you today to the Emotionally Healthy Leader Podcast. So great to be with you. Uh, today is part eight of this series uh, that we're calling Emotionally Healthy Spirituality. And our topic today is grow into an emotionally mature adult. Now, the, co- the topics we're covering in this series are meant to whet your appetite and create a hunger uh, in you, we pray, for more uh, and to introduce you to this vast world or ecosystem called emotionally of the discipleship that uh, we trust will transform uh, the way you follow Jesus and understand yourself and uh, work and pray and do relationships and lead and build community, uh, etc. Our mission is to transform church culture through the multiplication of deeply changed leaders and disciples. Uh, That's a large order. And so as we're talking in these podcasts about these large themes. Uh, There's just so much beneath the surface uh, that I pray and hope that you will dig into. In fact, uh, at the end of the series, in a few weeks, I'm going to do two podcasts integrating the truths we've talked about using case studies from you uh, and or questions and answers. Uh, So I want to invite you to uh, look at the topics of these different last eight weeks and then the next couple I'm going to do now. And go to emotionallyhealthy.org slash case study, and you'll see a basic format to fill out a case study as you seek to apply some of this material into your leadership and your context. Uh, Things like, you know, what is your context? What's the challenge you're facing? What have you done so far? What questions are you holding, et cetera? Uh, And so, again, go to emotionallyhealthy.org slash case study. In fact, I'll post that format as well on my social media uh, so you can take a look at it over the next couple of weeks. Or feel free to just send me a question uh, that you're carrying. Uh, just send it to askpete at emotionallyhealthy.org. That's askpete at emotionallyhealthy.org. And I'm going to weave those into uh, a podcast or two. All right, in a few weeks. Thanks so much. So let's dig into now our topic, grow into an emotionally mature adult. Now, I, I write or I speak in, on this whole theme of growing into an emotionally mature adult out of my own uh, embarrassment of the first 17 years of my Christian life when I was just so uh, profoundly unaware, uh, so thinly discipled, and yet I was leading a, a church. And it really was seen in a you know famous story now of, of our daughter Faith in the Pool, uh, which is in one of our books, where a couple came to visit Jerry and I when our kids were small. And uh, they came after you know, our, our third service, and we're having lunch at our house. And our kids were kind of running around. It was a very hot day, and they're talking and talking and talking. And we really we, we felt kind of trapped. I felt very trapped because they're talking. I want to be respectful. I want to be seen as a good pastor. And meanwhile, we're not really sure where our kids are, especially our youngest. And uh, we didn't want to offend. And they're talking and talking and talking. And um, make a long story short, on this hot day, finally Jerry got to a place of such panic. Looked at me. We finally said we got to do something. We you know we leapt up. And uh, went to the outside of the back door, and we have a little, we had a little three foot pool in the back. And there's our daughter naked, uh, standing on tippy toes with the water up to her chin. Uh, and oh my God, you know, I aged five years and ran, got her, pulled her out of that pool. And uh, I mean, the, the, the horror that she could have died because of our low differentiation, our emotional immaturity, our shallow discipleship, uh, that we didn't have the ability the training, the discipleship, the maturity to actually interrupt a conversation um, to go check on our daughter. Uh, I, I just, I was stuck at an immature level of spiritual and emotional development, uh, and my discipleship was just so shallow. It gives you a picture of how deadly uh, this is. A compartmentalized, I'll call it an unbiblical discipleship, has deadly consequences uh, on so many different uh, arenas. And a disconnection of emotional health and spiritual maturity uh, is just incredibly problematic. I didn't have any idea how to be present to other people and how to be present with myself. I basically lived out of my family of origin. Uh, and But yet, out of the pain of all this, and many of you know my story, uh, God used it in a powerful way to reveal himself uh, and transform my life and and the whole launching of what we call today Emotionally Healthy Discipleship 26 plus years later. So a bit of my story, after becoming a Christian uh, as a college student, I threw myself wholeheartedly into growing in Christ, reading Christian books and 
learning Bible study and worship and body life, etc., prayer, fasting, the gifts of the Spirit. And I immersed myself in all the best of Christian training and discipleship. Graduated seminary, planted a church then in New York City. But something was wrong, desperately wrong, uh, in me and in our church that we were building. Uh, people were growing in love for God, apparently, at least, uh, zeal, but it wasn't translating into love for people. Uh, it seemed like so many folks had zeal for Scripture uh, and prayer and worship, but they still remain defensive and judgmental and critical and unapproachable and unsafe uh, to be around. It was very confusing. And then Jerry began to share with me about how lonely she was in our marriage. She felt like a single mom with raising four daughters, didn't feel valued by me, didn't, she didn't feel cherished by me, even though I did love her. Uh, but that wasn't her experience uh, of living with me. And <clears throat> what did I know? Uh, I was just too busy doing God's work uh, and uh, what I considered God's work. In fact, the more our church grew and the more my leadership responsibilities increased, it seemed like the more impatient and irritated I became, uh, especially with those who slowed down my efforts to build things and expand God's kingdom. In some ways, I was salivating for a wrong view of success, you know, again, measured by numbers alone, and it kept me from actually seeing the people right in front of me. And so our church was growing in number, numbers, but uh, we were recycling the same old childish conflicts uh, among us, month after month, year after year. And I finally had to acknowledge uh, by six, year six or seven that something was really wrong. Something was seriously wrong. That here were people faithful uh, in terms of church activities, but they were detached and angry at home. We had gifted teachers who uh, were unteachable themselves or proud and uh, defensive, they, people who knew their Bible but were unaware of their defensiveness or irritability or how easily triggered they were. We had people who prayed uh, that were great workers in the church, great intercessors, but their marriage uh, was falling apart or they were highly critical. We had nice Christians uh, who were so nice, uh, but they avoided conflict at all costs and they pretended everything was fine sometimes in relationships when things were not fine and then they would do something passive aggressive uh, or very immature. And it became obvious uh, to me, and I think to a number of us, that the quality of love inside the church was not really that different from the quality of love outside the church. Uh, and that there was a lot of emotional immaturity uh, in action. And uh, there were glaring contradictions uh, that were there. And the problem was I couldn't really identify it because I was living it out myself. Uh, I had a disconnected, and we had a disconnected uh, spirituality from what we call emotional health. And by the grace of God, I finally saw it, uh, that I was an emotional infant stuck, and yet I was leading the church. Uh, I was just another person who appeared to be growing in love for God, uh, but I wasn't growing in love for people. Like, wow. Like, I didn't know what to do with anger. I didn't know how to be honest in relationships. I didn't know how to, how to deal with conflicts. Uh, I didn't know how to say a respectful no to people. I uh, ended up saying yes way more than I wanted. And I didn't know how to speak clearly and respectfully and honestly. Uh, and so that's why that fundamental truth that uh, we often say is core uh, to emotionally healthy leadership and discipleship, and that is that emotional health and spiritual maturity are inseparable, that it's not possible to be spiritually mature while remaining emotionally immature. And that a person can be 30 uh, chronologically 35 or chronologically 65 or chronologically 85 and still be an emotional infant or child in their relationships unless there is intentional discipleship and mentoring and work done. In fact, if you've never taken the um, emotionally healthy assessment uh, that will help you discern in 15 minutes, am I an emotional infant, child, adolescent, or adult, go to emotionallyhealthy.org slash mature take that. Well worth your time and energy. That's emotionallyhealthy.org slash mature. Uh, you know, emotional infants end up treating others as objects to meet our needs. And infants can't empathize with other people. Or emotional ch children whine and distance and pout and lie and withhold and appease and aren't open and honest about their needs. Can't do that. Emotional adolescents are defensive and threatened by criticism. But emotional adults are able to ask for what they need and want and prefer. And they can speak clearly and honestly and respectfully. They can enter other people's worlds. They can resolve conflicts and negotiate uh, uh, differences in a mature way. But it never occurred to me how badly I was failing to see a central teaching of Jesus. I think 
one of my biggest surprises was my own blindness to what is so clear in Scripture. And, and actually, it took me, even as I got into this journey, it took me a while to actually to see it so clearly that Jesus, uh, this was a major thrust for him, that you can't separate loving God from loving people. I mean, when he was asked to give what's the one greatest commandment, he said, there's two, you know, love God and love people. Uh, in fact, the the reason Jesus was in, what one major reason Jesus was in so much conflict with the Pharisees and Sadducees and the Bible teachers of his day was they may have memorized the first five books of the Old Testament and prayed, you know, three times a day and fasted and tithed and all that, but uh, they were zealous, but then they were, quote, committed, uh, but they were judgmental and condescending and critical and lacking in mercy. They were cold. And they had a wrong measurement of spiritual maturity. And so they judged Jesus for hanging out with sinners and tax collectors. And therefore, Jesus quoted scripture to them. The scriptures they apparently loved. He says, go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. And he quotes the prophet Hosea to them. But he says, no, it, it, God's after love. He's after mercy. And, and, then, and then Jesus, you know, as well, taught to the Pharisees and the Sadducees. He said, listen, they tell you that if someone has something against you, finish your worship and go over and then get reconciled to your brother. And Jesus reversed that and said, no, no, no. If someone's got something against you, leave your gift at the altar and get reconciled first and then come back and worship. In other words, the relationship for Jesus was, was actually, he puts it before worship. And you say, wait, because they're inseparable. And he was clashing with the, again, the religious leaders of his day. Because for Jesus, the essence of true spirituality is to love people well. And our love for God is in so many ways measured by our love for people. Uh, it's, the, uh, it's the oil light in the car. And Paul makes the same point in 1 Corinthians 13, where he said, you can have great faith and great generosity and great spiritual gifts, but without love, they're nothing. And in other words, if people experience us as cold or unsafe or rigid, rigid or unapproachable, it doesn't matter how anointed we are, we're, we're immature. Uh, and that's why we talk a lot about, it's, we're not just about a slowdown spirituality, a contemplative spirituality, but we're about this thing called emotional health, which really is about learn as loving people. It's, it's how people experience us. Let me just give you a couple examples, try to put some flesh on this. Uh, one pastor, uh, pastor was sharing with us uh, recently how he, he would always go home and be with his family, extended family and family of origin uh, as an adult, but he was always angry and frustrated because he wanted to change them. He wanted them to be different. Um, and they experienced him as annoying and frustrating. And he just shared how he finally let go and simply loved them. It changed everything on their uh, yearly uh, vacation together. But he couldn't see that being with his family and as the pastor Christian uh, and frustrated all the time and angry all the time because they weren't doing life the way he thinks thought they should was a contradiction of everything he was speaking. <laughs> but he finally saw it. Or another pastor friend whom Jerry was with um, recently and uh, sharing, he shared how he doesn't do feelings uh, and he's not present with people, but he's, he's a task oriented guy getting, getting things done has his to-do list, uh, but he's not present with himself. And so Jerry just sent him a few questions to begin asking himself about to, when he meets, when he's in staff meetings and et cetera. And, and things like, you know, where do you allow yourself to be weak and vulnerable this week? How can you do that? Or how can you reframe and live differently from just getting it done? What would it look like for you to be present to the people that you're working with? Uh, how can you be more personal and less formal and maybe start even communications with a friendly greeting uh, and listen more and restrain from leading every conversation. And she wrote, how can you be, how can you practice even being comfortable with silence in the company of others in, in a meeting? It's just fascinating, but, but for walking out, just changing, just getting the work done to actually loving and being present, what a challenge for this particular pastor. And another, I, can think of a very gifted individual, but a dirty fighter all the way, you know, not, you know, sarcastic and stuffing his anger and frustration and then triangling with another person and being passive aggressive and yet so gifted. Um, and uh, not seeing all this relationship 
uh, skill stuff that we're talking about here is kind of mamby pamby, secondary, not as spiritual as prayer and fasting and body life and mission. And I think of another uh, uh, couple of spouses, two spouses in particular, who, uh, with with severely underdeveloped sense of selves, selves, and are basically doormats, uh, and as a result, don't love well, whether it be their spouse or their coworkers or their children or their friends, because they haven't developed a sense of who they are. You can't die to a self if you don't have a self. And so their love is a bit twisted because they're not even coming to the table with clarity about themselves, and they're not being honest in so many conversations. It's even something as simple as, what movie do you want to go to? What restaurant would you like to go to? And being able to say, this is what I would like. This is, the, this is what I'd like to do versus saying yes, and then you go, and then later you're just kind of like angry that you even went because you shouldn't have said yes. Or being able to say, you know, I'm physically or emotionally tired right now. Um, and uh, no, I prefer not to do that or go on that trip. Uh, versus not recognizing your limits, going and then on a trip or to an event, and then you're really grumpy the whole time because you don't have the resources to actually be there. Um, or another path to a friend I was with uh, recently who just had a deep desire to be liked and validated by those he led, leads and, and driven by lots of fears. Uh, and as a result, makes all kinds of poor decisions. And again, it's not always truthful, but it's not loving well because he's not uh, clear internally uh, about what's going on inside of him. And so as a result, his emotional immaturity uh, is kind of be is there along with his massive gifting uh, and, quote, productivity uh, for the church. And then finally, I think of another uh, pastor friend who just, uh, you know, we'd had some mentoring relationships with and relationship with and just e she was e easily triggered and had a number of emotional allergies and uh, just, again, unaware of where that was all coming from uh, and had not done the kind of inner work that uh, would not cause her to be folks to walk on tiptoes around her, at least knowing there are certain issues that maybe she would explode on. So when we grow, when we accept Jesus and we grow uh, as in Christ, it does involve growing into an emotionally mature adult uh, and that's not natural. That requires discipleship. In other words, learning to love others and relate to love others well, especially in stress and especially in conflict, it's not automatic. This requires intentional discipleship. And that's why uh, over these 26 years, for Jerry and I, it's been implement. How do we? Impl our struggle was from the very beginning, how do we implement theology into people's lives in relationships? And we began this long journey to develop skills uh, to gather tool skills and develop some skills, create some skills to help disciple people in relationships to become emotionally mature adults. The title of this podcast. In fact, this became so big that the what we call the emotionally discipleship course actually has two parts, and part two is called emotionally healthy relationships and a desire to move people from brokenness to wholeness, from defensiveness and blaming and low self awareness to approachability and high self-awareness and, and delight and courage in their relationships. And um, that's why these we, developed, we ended up landing on eight skills um, that we did trial and research with uh, for years, decades, uh, both in our international context here in New York City, as well as traveling around the world, um, basically getting the nuances out uh, that applied and cultures all over the world. And we realized people needed to actually do the scriptures and not simply talk about it. And again, these skills are simple to understand, but very difficult to implement. Um, but the goal with the skill is meant to uh, implant, establish and plant a theology, a language, a framework, so you can build a healthy culture, whether it's you and a friend, whether it's a family, whether it's a community, whether it's a church, a ministry, um, so again, let me, you've got to taste this and you've got to actually step on a bike to actually try it. And so go to emotionallyhealthy.org slash preview. Uh, that's emotionallyhealthy.org slash preview and check out uh, one of the skills it's called the community temperature reading. It's in the Emotionally Healthy Relationships course. It's free. Download it and just try it. Just taste it. 
And it, what I'm talking about will make some sense to you about when we talk about applying theology in relationships through the use of some simple but difficult to do skills, especially under stress. Stress. In other words, we've got to put flesh on theology. But even learning a skill in a in a course is not enough. It's got to be it's got to be worked out in practice. So we had a pastor. We were in another country, and we. Uh, had done it, just finished a two and a half day conference on emotionally healthy leadership. And uh, so this pastor invited us back to uh, his hometown uh, and we stayed at a, you know, a hotel and they was going to take us out the next day uh, to see the city. And um, so we said, okay, you know, we just gotten there and, uh, but we just finished this really three days of conferences. Of course, we've been traveling before that. And when Jerry and I are in our hotel room that night, we realized, mm, tomorrow's our Sabbath. We don't really want to go traveling. Uh, we just really need to rest. Uh, we'll just walk around town ourselves later. And so called him the next day and, and said, you know, thank you so much for the invitation, but Jerry and I are going to uh, just stay home uh, in our hotel room and we'll walk around town. But it's our Sabbath. We're really tired, but thank you so much. Uh, they, they had never, they, they were in shock. Uh, they'd never heard of such a thing. Uh, how, how could we say no? Uh, because in their culture, if someone asks you to, uh, to take you on a you know, tour, you say yes, of course. And and in fact, he, he was exhausted, and so was he was going to bring his whole family because you're supposed to bring your whole family. And they were all exhausted from the you know three day conference in a different city, um, and they ended up having a huge conversation about it. But he said to me, Pete, I, I, in the three days of, conf- of the conference, I, I didn't understand what you were talking about about emotionally healthy discipleship. But after that one interaction with you, I get it. Uh, and he was so grateful to have his day free as a family. In other words, the, the, the point of, uh, uh, of this focus on growing into an emotionally mature adult, the, 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 the focus on this relationships thing, that's so hard for us because we're not good at it. We have not been trained in it. And when you've lived for decades and you've been highly trained like so many of us have been in scripture and theology and leadership stuff, uh, to get into this area of relationships, this nitty gritty, it's it's humbling. It, it it just breaks you. But do you understand that God is love, right? He is love, and and it's got to be worked out relationally. We, we we see Him through other people as well. You know, God is not about shape up or ship out. God is not a, you make one false move. God, God is not just putting up with our messes. God's DNA is not disappointment and disapproval towards people. No, God so loves the world. He loved the world to send his son Jesus, and he loves the world. And God is so much greater than the one people think about who he is. And there are so many folks around us and so many leaders like us who walk around in in pain and shame and often disgrace. And thus we strut around with these protective shells of kind of posturing and how we doing and how do we measure up to everybody else. And it just, we're just stunted. And, and we actually see our shortcomings and blemishes as proof that we're not worthy. And so when we grow and mature in loving, because God is love, and we help shift people's attention to the fact that they're, they're made in the image of God and, and, there's goodness in them. It's not all you're all a wretched sinner, nothing. You're just a nothing when nothing good dwells in you. Yeah, or sin taints you, but you're made in God's image. There is goodness in you. And God delights in you as a human being. He loves you. He loves you no matter what. Uh, I, I like what Greg Boyle once said. He goes, He's the no matter whatness of God, no matter what he loves you. And this puts and so the skills and and the, this commitment to grow into our relationships puts flesh in our theology. You know, it has been uh, said, and I think rightly so, that Gnosticism has been a, a, an overriding issue confronting the church throughout its whole 2,000 years, and especially in the first 400 years. Gnostic thought, Gnostic practice, Paul was, you know, combating in his epistles, uh, whether, and John, we see it in John, we see it in the book of Revelation, uh, in fact, at the Council of Chalcedon in 451, church leaders had to declare clearly that Jesus was fully God and fully human. I, God came in flesh and lived among us. Uh, and this is so important because 
we talk about emotional maturity, we talk about relationships, we're talking about fleshly theology. We're not Gnostics, we're not we're not super spiritual beings living as if we're angel in heavens. Our our feet are grounded on earth, and we're calling people to live out a spirituality that is grounded in the here and now. And so that's why growing into an emotionally mature adult is embracing in so many ways uh, Jesus, who's fully God and fully human, and we embrace our full humanity and that our and our spirituality and our our um, walk with Jesus is fleshed out with people in in real time in a real world. Just a, two things just to consider as we kind of close our podcast here. The first is this. You want to just be aware and think about what was your family of origins capability for emotional connection. In other words, your ability to love well is connected to how spiritually secure the environment you grew up in was. So you want to look at your family's ability to connect well. For example, were you taught to identify and express what was going on inside of you, your, your feelings when you were hurt and, uh, and uh, distressed? How were you, were you comforted? Uh, or if the emotional connection was lacking, you ended up restricting emotions and minimizing what was bothering you. Uh, did you learn to trust other people? Did you learn to respect others and take turns? How'd your, how'd your caregivers handle fear and shame and anger and sadness and jealousy? Were you allowed to be a child or were you expected to take responsibility for your parents' feelings? And did you learn to speak clearly and respectfully and honestly? Did you learn to check out assumptions and not mind read? Did you learn, did you learn to make complaints in a respectful way and do appreciations? Negotiate differences. Do clean fighting versus dirty fighting. The list goes on. Did you learn to listen and give people your undivided attention when they were talking to you and not interrupt uh, or feel what other people are feeling? Again, I like what David Augsburger said years ago. Being heard is so close to being loved that for the average person, they're virtually indistinguishable. And so how did that work out in your family of origin? How's that impacted you today? And the greater the deficits, of course, the greater discipleship work we need to do in Christ to develop communities that are extraordinary in the way that we love and what makes us different than all the rest of the communities in the world is we love like God loves the world and we people feel safe around us. They don't think of us as judgmental. They see us as safe. And so then secondly, I want to invite you to uh, take some practical steps in your discipleship to grow into an emotionally mature adult. Uh, it can be scary. It can be terrifying. Uh, it's not automatic. But the grace of God and the spirit of Jesus who lives inside of you, who raised Christ from the dead, um, and there is power inside of you to actually change, to rewire yourself from the inside out by the Holy Spirit. The skills in the Emotionally Healthy Relationship course are actually, as one pastor has said, it is the secret sauce. Uh, it's the secret sauce of putting flesh on our theology. And... Uh, and by repeatedly practicing mature, godly behaviors, we've seen thousands and thousands of people freed from lifelong cycles of relational immaturity. And that, it's actually a key, this is a key link we're talking about here to grow into a mature mother and father of the faith. Um, in fact, I know for us, our intentionality in this area, Jerry and, uh, and me, to grow into an emotionally mature adults, and we're still on our journey, has transformed every arena of our lives, from our marriage to parenting of our four daughters, to being grandparents, to friendships, uh, and the entire culture of the church that we led for 26 years. So I hope I'm whetting your appetite to get serious about this. And uh, so let me invite you again to go to emotionallyhealthy.org slash preview and uh, check out uh, one, that first skill in the Emotionally Healthy Relationships course. You'll have access to both courses in the first session, but check out the one in the relationships course um, and do it. I think you'll be so glad you did. Uh, and then I want to invite you again, do, do, as I finish this series, send in questions you're carrying. Just send it to askpete at emotionallyhealthy.org or send me a case study of a real-life situation you're wrestling with in your community as a leader. Go to emotionallyhealthy.org slash case study, and then I may uh, wrestle with it actually here in one of our podcasts. I want to close with a minute of silence here uh, together. Uh, and... Uh, to just ask the Lord to just take a nice deep breath and uh, let's just be still before the Lord uh, and wait patiently for him and inviting the Holy Spirit to fill us, uh, transform us, 
as we surrender our will to his will and let him take you and let him take me on a journey, wherever he wants to take you today on this journey, exciting journey of following Jesus. Let's begin. Thank you, everybody. God bless you. Have a great day.